Who are you? J. Cole. Welcome to Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, J. Cole. We live in the system, and that's why I was trying to say earlier, it all comes down to the system. Anybody would do, for the most part, anything for the money. I mean, he's never not been a dope artist. People talk for him. His numbers speak for himself. This is the moment that a lot of your favorite rappers hit a crossroad. They did what the fuck they set out to do. The fruits of their labor started working against them. That same energy and that same like passion they put into the craft was gone, and it was replaced by comfort. Jermaine Lamar Cole, better known as J. Cole, has emerged as one of the most influential and respected artists in the world of modern hip hop. Known as the middle child of the genre, he's managed to bridge the gap between the old school and the new school of rap, creating conversations that unites both generations. In this documentary, we'll explore the life and legacy of J. Cole, tracing his journey from his early humble days in North Carolina to his position as one of the most important players in the rap game today. J. Cole is known for his impact on the representation of black culture in the music industry and his lasting legacy in the genre of hip-hop. But what's the secret to J. Cole's longevity and relevance in the ever-changing world of hip-hop? Let's find out as we dive in and explore the life and legacy of the middle child of hip-hop, J. Cole. January 28, 1985, born in the military base of Frankfurt, West Germany, Jermaine Lamar Cole was born to Kay and James Cole. His father, James, was in the U.S. Army and his mother, Kay, was a postal worker for the U.S. Postal Service. Together, the two raised a young Jermaine for a little less than a year when Cole's father abandoned the family. This lack of a father figure affected Cole growing up and what he would express through his music. At eight months old, Kay moved Jermaine and his older brother, Zach, to Fayetteville, North Carolina. Growing up in a multi-ethnic environment with a mix of black and white neighbors, Cole was exposed to a diverse range of musical styles from country to rock to hip-hop. Cole's childhood home in Fayetteville is an important part of his personal story and early music career. The house located at 2014 Forest Hill Drive became the inspiration for J. Cole's third studio album, which released in 2014 and is also titled 2014 Forest Hill Drive. The album was named after the house that J. Cole lived in during his teenage years, and it served as a symbol of his humble beginnings and the struggles he faced while growing up. Cole often speaks about his upbringing in interviews and in his music, highlighting the hardships he's faced in growing up in a single parent household and the impact it had on him as a person and as an artist. And welcome to my house. This is 2014 Forest Hills Drive, Fayetteville, North Carolina, 28303. This is the first house I ever owned in my life. And it just happens to be the last house I grew up in. My goal and my intention uh, is some family will get to move into this place very close to rent free. Um, and we'll give them two years. Every two years, a new family will move in. And hopefully, by the time they leave, they'll be in a much better position than they were when they came. In 2014, J. Cole purchased the home that he grew up in and turned it into a rental property exclusively for single mothers. He also opened it up for fans to do tours, allowing them to experience a piece of his personal history and the inspiration behind his music. Cole first started rapping when he was just 12 years old. However, it wasn't until he was 15 that he saw rapping as a viable career option when his mother gifted him an ASRX sampler for Christmas. It was during this time that he began to start honing in his production skills, even producing music under the alias Blazer then later changing it to The Therapist before he arrived at the name J. Cole. Later on, Jermaine collaborated with a local group called Bomb Shelter, contributing both his rapping and production skills as a member of the group. According to Hip Hop and More, the story of Cole working with the duo started when a 14-year-old Jermaine discovered them through the school newspaper. He went on to hit up Bomb Shelter on AOL for five months straight until they finally replied. It was clear Cole was very persistent from a young age. Shortly after, they invited the rapper Blaze at the time to attend one of the pair's shows, which his mom drove him to, and he hopped on stage along with multiple older rappers doing an open mic segment. As Cole himself remembers it, he killed it, and no one's quick to disagree. From that point on, the three started to work together on material. I left some music linked in the description if you guys want to see it. J. Cole attended Terry Sanford High School in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where he excelled academically and athletically, graduating with a 4.2 GPA. He was also a standout basketball player in high school, and even earned a scholarship offer to attend St. John's University in New York City. He ultimately decided to attend because his chances of securing a recording contract would be better 
in New York City. While in college, J. Cole began to pursue music more seriously. He initially majored in computer science, but quickly changed his major to communications. In an interview with Interview Magazine, Cole stated, I actually started off majoring in computer science but I knew right away I wasn't gonna stay with him. It was because I had this one professor who was the loneliest, saddest man I ever known. He was a programmer and I knew that I didn't want to do whatever he did. So after that, I switched to communications. While in school, Cole released the mixtape, The Come Up, with samples from Kanye, Jay-Z, and Nas. The mixtape's vibe was raw with no gimmicks, just straight bars. This started getting his name talked about around the city. So a little later, he capitalized off the buzz and would release his first music video ever for a single, Simba. Momentum was starting to build and so was his network. Cole's manager at the time, Mike Rooney, would pull some strings to get a meeting with Mark Pitts. Mark Pitts was Biggie Small's former manager and the CEO of Bystorm, so he was well connected in the industry. He would be a very important player to the success of J. Cole. But I'll get to that in a second because it's important to know who Rooney is. Mike Rooney, Cole's manager, was the nephew of superstar producer Corey Rooney. J. Cole and Rooney initially met at Baseline Recording Studios, an infamous recording studio in Manhattan. Cole saw Rooney as a well-connected person, so he would later message him on MySpace, and the first song Cole had him listen to was School Days. Rooney immediately saw something in Cole and wanted to help him shine brighter. In an interview with Revolt, Rooney explained how he pitched Cole to work with him. That was my pitch. Drove him to my uncle's mansion, showed him a bunch of plaques, the mansion was in Upper Brookville, New York. It's literally down the street from where Mark Anthony and J Lo lived. With J Cole on the city's radar, he had to figure out a way to expand his brand from the momentum he was given. So he and his friend Hamad would create their own version of Jay Z's Rockefeller or Diddy's Bad Boys. Cole would eventually come up with the name Dreamville, combining Fairville, where he was from, with New York City, the city of dreams. At the time, they were using the name of the brand just to sell merch, but later on down the line, it would become something much bigger where Cole would sign artists under. Around this time, Jay-Z was getting ready to release his 10th studio album, American Gangster. This gave Cole an idea to pitch himself to Jay-Z in person. What can you say about this? Because there's some connection to Jay-Z, isn't there here, on top of the world? Oh, that is the song that, um, the song that I sampled for Jay-Z's American Gangster album. It's a song that I did called On Top of the World. I made the beat, I did the hook and everything. It was so perfect for American Gangster, dog. I, matter of fact, I was at my job, I was at work. I, would, I was telemarketing, mm. but I never made no calls. I was just always on the internet, <laughs> on the fucking rap blogs and shit. And I seen, I think it was all hip hop or something, they had a, a, a post like, Jay-Z, new album, blah, blah, blah. And they, they had the concept and all that. They even had the artwork done. I was like, oh shit, this is it, God. Like, <laughs> I'm like, yo, you know what? I bet he's probably gonna be at the studio tonight. Okay, let's let's just go. I had a feeling, man. So we hopped the train. We went there. We got a little bottle. We was just sitting outside for like two hours drinking. It started raining. I'm sitting there with a beat CD. With a t-shirt on. <laughs> t-shirt on and a bottle. Just waiting, just praying that Jay is gonna show up. So Jay gets out of the car. Walks up to the building, and I'm like trying to build up the nerve to go up to him with the CD. <laughs> After you waited all that time in waited the rain. Waited all that time in the rain, and I'm like, yo, Jay, uh, yo, I, I, here, I got this. <laughs> I waited outside for Jay-Z for like three hours in the rain, me and Eve, hoping he would come. And by the grace of God, he came, but it didn't happen like I thought. He just dissed me and was like, get out of here. <laughs> Despite getting rejected from Jay-Z, Cole didn't give up on his dreams. At this point, he graduated from college and watched all of his friends get jobs while he was still pursuing the life of a rapper. But with a little bit of success and popularity from his music, Cole started to get complacent with his craft and his ambition. I had just graduated college. I was broke. Nigga, I was like struggling to pay my rent. I ain't had no job. And I was kind of being complacent because I had crazy music. And I was kind of chilling, like as if that was good enough to get me to where I needed to go. Yeah. And I had a realization. One time, nigga, I'm in a party. I'm drunk and I'm high. So I had to leave the party and go to the backyard. So I'm back there paranoid, like, oh my God, like, nigga, I'm going through it. Nigga, life is on me, nigga, rent. All my college friends went and got jobs. Nigga, I'm over here doing some rap shit. And these niggas walk in the backyard to come find me. And they're like, yo, we want to holler at you right quick. Bro, it turned into an intervention. These niggas was like, hey bro, what you doing? You say you wanna do this music shit, but like all you doing is really just like hanging out, partying and shit. 
Mind you, one part of me is like, nigga, y'all, I'll be with y'all niggas. Like, yeah. the fuck are you talking about? But when they was talking, bro, I swear to God, I sobered up quickly. It was almost like I was on the stage. Nigga, literally, after that, I thought about basketball. Why I ain't making it basketball? Nigga, I love to play. And at this point, I'm 21 years old, you know what I mean, 22. And I'm like, nigga, why you didn't make it in basketball? Because you wasn't fucking working. You thought you'd be outside dribbling the fucking ball, doing something, when really niggas was in the gym with trainers, like putting in work, shooting a thousand shots a day. And your dumb ass over there thinking you doing something, mimicking Iverson. Yeah. So it was like, yo, do you really want to look back 10, 20 years from now with this music shit and be like, the reason you didn't make it in music because you ain't put in the work. So I was like, fuck it. That was the where the warm up came from. The intervention from his friends lit a fire in Cole. So he started working on his infamous mixtape, The Warm Up, but he couldn't do it alone without any help. Cole was struggling financially and couldn't pay his rent, but his landlord, Muhammad, believed in him so much that he let Cole put months of rent on layaway while he would work on the project. Cole even shouted out Muhammad multiple times throughout his music catalog. Okay, back when I was sleeping in my mama crib, but even back when I was up there in my mama crib, paying 1700 for the rent, money well spent. Mike Rooney will also play a crucial role in its success of this project. He would pay for studio time for Cole at professional recording spaces like 333 Studios and KMA Studios in Manhattan. While Cole was working on a mixtape, Kirk Lightburn, who was actually Mark Pitt's cousin, would randomly play Lights Please in front of Pitt's. And from that, he immediately wanted to meet the rapper. Kirk Lightburn only knew of this song through Cole's manager, Mike Rooney. The Dreamville team, while hard at work, would wait to hear something from Mark Pitts. After waiting three months, they assumed nothing would come from the potential opportunity. But unaware to them, Mike Pitts was planning to present the track to Jay-Z himself. And it was perfect timing. Jay was just starting Rock Nation. When Mark Pitts finally played him Lights Please, Hope, just like Pitts, wanted to meet him. This led to a number of meetings that resulted in Cole becoming the first signed artist at Rock Nation in 2009. Shortly after signing, Cole finished and released his classic mixtape, The Warm Up, on June 10th, 2009. The mixtape showcased his lyrical dexterity and was where we got a glimpse of his iconic storytelling ability. When it dropped, the mixtape immediately spread across college campuses everywhere. With so many people resonating with the tape and its messages, it secured J. Cole's place as a leader in a new generation of hip hop. This is a time period where people are used to the street image being pushed, but instead, Cole related to this new audience with his normal guy persona who played ball and went to college to pursue his dreams. You, you could you could always see that student of the game that like Kanye kind of broke away from, you know, even in his Drink Champs interview, he was like, nigga, I just used the backpack thing, backpack rap thing to get clout. I, 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 I didn't like any of your raps, but like J. Cole loved that shit. And you could tell like from the beginning of forever ago, this nigga was like super backpack and he continued to just elevate that sound. In an interview with Complex, Cole described the meaning of the mixtape's name, stating, It's based on this story from when I was in high school and got cut from the team. A lot of people get cut from the team, but it's really up to how people handle the shit. Some people quit, they get spiteful, they say fuck the coach, and they won't try out no more. Some people will just go harder and use it for motivation to make sure that next year it's undeniable. When you listen to the warm-up, it's clear that Cole uses rejection from Hove as motivation for his next season or his mixtape. His persistent mindset and attitude he had since he was rapping under the name Blazer with Bomb Shelter at 14 proved itself right once again. 2010 was a monumental year for J. Cole. He would make the 2010 XXL freshman list and go on a college tour growing his fan base by performing at schools like Rutgers and Syracuse. He had singles that would become instant classics like All I Want Is You with Miguel and Who Dat, which was a solo single. Things kept skyrocketing for Cole as he continued to drop hit after hit and promote his highly anticipated debut album. When he was ready to drop his album, originally named Vilmatic, a spin off of Nas's Illmatic, his record label didn't believe the project would sell, and he was forced to redo the whole project. So on November 12, 2010, Cole would release his third mixtape, Friday Night Lights, which had most of the songs that were supposed to be on his debut album. His new mixtape and the single along with it, In the Morning featuring Drake, would quickly become the second most searched and trending topic on Twitter and Google. It then went on to win Best Mixtape of the Year at the 2011 BET Hip Hop Awards. There was no doubt that Friday Night Lights was a classic. This is Cole rapping at his hungriest in my opinion, and it doesn't get any better than that. After going back to back to back with three critically successful mixtapes, J. Cole would finally release his debut album, Cold World, The Sideline Story, 
on September 27, 2011. The album featured Trey Songz, Drake, Jay-Z, and Missy Elliott. And just as people love Cole's mixtape, they were raving over his new studio album. The Sideline Story reached number one on Billboard and sold over 200,000 copies in the first week. There were mixed reviews about the album, but numbers don't lie. It was clear that J. Cole would play a huge part in the next generation of hip hop. Rapping from the perspective of coming up and making it in New York, Cole sprinkled in hints of social commentary that really made him stand out. And with the cinematic production of the album with these elaborate string sections and glistening pianos, the silent story literally feels like that, a story. In 2013, Cole released his second studio album, Born Center. This album has a special place in my heart because it was my first real introduction into J. Cole. The sophomore album was originally supposed to drop June 25th, but he heard about Kanye dropping his Yeezus album on June 18th. Cole changed his release date to the same day. There was so much talk from hip hop blogs about who would win the summer, with Mac Miller and Wale both dropping summer albums in addition to Cole and Ye. In the first two weeks, it seemed as though Kanye's Yeezus was on top, being the number one album on a billboard. But in the third week, Cole's Born Center beat out Kanye's album and took the number one spot and essentially won the summer of 2013. In an interview with Hip Hop DX, Cole stated, I only get brief moments to appreciate things. I might get a two minute thought of like, wow, you really did sell more than Kanye. You currently have sold more records than Kanye West album, which came out the same day. Then I'm back on focusing on what's next. The title Born Center was inspired by Biggie Smalls and the line is even sampled on the opening track. The album with its dark and heavy detailed production feels like you're entering some type of exclusive society that's not supposed to be seen by the public. The album's subjects spoke on our flaws and sins and how they make us mortal and human. Cole drives in the point that, that if we're always good and angelic, we wouldn't be human. Essentially, it's about the duality of man and being okay with accepting the good and the bad. It's no secret that there's a major problem with police brutality and abuse of power from the police in America. The history of this runs hundreds of years deep, but I'd rather not get into that right now. In 2014, Michael Brown was one of the hundreds of black victims to this issue. As many other people did, J. Cole took to the internet to express his pain for the loss of Michael Brown. J. Cole would release his single Be Free on SoundCloud as a response to the murder of Michael Brown from the hands of a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, with the message saying, rest in peace to Michael Brown and to every young black man murdered in America. Whether it's by the hands of white or black, I pray that one day the world be filled with peace and rid of justice. Only then we will all be free. He would then go on to perform the song live on David Letterman's show, which birthed this iconic performance. I'm letting you know that it ain't no gun they make that can kill my soul. Oh no. All we want to do is take the chains off. All we want to do is break the chains off. Yeah. What drew me to his music the most was like the subject matter and the content that he would put into it. So not only was he like a party rapper and good for radio, he was also good for like intellectual content and stuff that wasn't too deep, but also wasn't too surface level. And I like artists like that. Later that year, Cole would release a seven minute trailer on YouTube to promote his next upcoming album. The video featured him walking around his hometown, reminiscing on stories and talking to people who live there. Then on December 9th, 2014, Cole dropped his most celebrated album, 2014 Forest Hill Drive. There was a point where J. Cole was known as the guy who Jay-Z signed. But with this album, Cole really came into his own and put that conversation to rest. The 12 track record was a lot more subtle when it came to production compared to his last two albums, which allowed him to really showcase his storytelling with songs like Wet Dreams and O3 and Adolescence being clear examples of that. The biggest standout of the album though was the fact that there were no features rapping or singing along with Cole, which ended up not mattering in the end because on March 31st, 2015, Forest Hill Drive became the first hip hop album in 25 years to be certified platinum without any features. Then double platinum in 2016 and triple platinum in 2019. The album sold 371,000 copies the first week and once again claimed the number one spot on the Billboard 200. A month later on his birthday, J. Cole and his two signees under Dreamville, Boz and Omen would release a debut compilation project called Revenge of the Dreamers. The mixtape served as a showcase of skill from Boz and Omen, 
Though Cole did do his thing on the project as well. It was at this point where J. Cole was basically on top of the world. With a respectable discography, rappers signed under his labels and name constantly being brought up in the age old top three conversation along with Kendrick and Drake, J. Cole was truly living up to the rumors of leading the next generation of hip hop and dispelled the label of that rapper that Jay-Z signed. It's 2016 and J. Cole's track record is near flawless. In the previous year, Cole released Revenge of the Dreamers 2 under Dreamville along with its signed members including Ari Lennox, Luke, Boz, Omen, and Kaz. But while collaborating, he was working on his fourth album to add to his discography and he had a lot to say and he needed time to get his thoughts together. In October of 2016, Cole would go silent, announcing at a show that he wouldn't be performing for a long time. Before I get out of here, this is my last show for a very long time. So this is a Three months later in the year, in early December, with no announcement from Cole, his next studio album, For Your Eyes Only, will become available for pre-order on Apple Music. A week later, a title exclusive documentary called Eyes will release which featured behind the scenes footage of Cole working on an album and two iconic music videos, False Prophets and Everybody Dies. These two songs and the videos that accompanied them were full of criticism for rappers he used to look up to while on a come up and the younger rappers trying to make a name for themselves at the moment. On the track Everybody Dies, Cole criticizes the new generation of mumble rappers. A lot of people assume the song was about rappers like Lil Uzi and 21 Savage and the rapper who was the epitome of this trope, of course, Lil Pimp. Oh, well, Lil Pump, my bad. One of the big superstars of the world, Lil Pimp. But we'll get back to that in a moment. On the second track, False Prophets, Cole doesn't drop any names, but it was clear he was rapping about Kanye West in the first verse. What is the intention behind this? You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. like, what's the balance of like selfish versus like the world? And I feel like the danger there is that there are people that are like, Kanye's for the people. And it's like, hmm. Right. J. Cole's fourth studio album, For Your Eyes Only, referencing Tupac's All Eyes On Me, released on December 9th, 2016. The album tells the story of Cole's childhood friend who went under the pseudonym James McMillan Jr. for the sake of privacy. The story narrates how he goes from selling crack to falling in love and starting a family. After the track changed where James gets murdered, we found out that almost the entire album was a tape made by James to tell his story to his daughter after he was gone. Although somber by nature, this album is one of Cole's must slept on projects in my opinion. It's here where we get to really see his storytelling ability really elevate to another level. It will be two years before Cole would release another project. On April 16, 2018, Cole would announce his listening party in New York two hours before it started, saying, first come, first serve. The listening party will be for his fifth studio album, KOD, which released days later on April 20th. The name KOD had three different interpretations of the name, Kids on Drugs, Kill Our Demons, and King Overdosed. The 12-track album was Cole's third project with no features except for Kill Edward, which ended up just being Cole, but with his voice pitched down. In a first extended interview J. Cole's been in since 2014 Forest Hill Drive, he speaks on who Kill Edward is, explaining to Vulture Magazine that KOD's only guest feature came from his alter ego, Kill Edward, inspired by his stepfather. Following the release of the album, rappers Lil Pump and Smoke Perp had an issue with his track 1985, where they felt like he was dissing them specifically. Responding to Cole rapping about how a lot of rappers at that time would fall off, the two released the song Fuck J. Cole and even led multiple F. J. Cole chants at their concerts. This caused Cole fans to rebuttal and do the same thing. But when Cole heard a fuck Lil Pump and fuck 6 ix 9 chant starting at his show, he put it into it immediately. See if I can pay for you a Come here, little man, let me talk with you. See if I can paint for you the lost picture. Congrats, cause you made it out your mama house. I hope you make enough to buy your mama house. I see you watch Icy and your whip form. I got some good advice, never quit torn. Cause that's the way we eat here in this rap game. 
I'm fucking with your fucking little rap name. I hear your music and I know that raps change. A bunch of folks will say that that's a bad thing. Cause everything's commercial when it's pop now. Trap drums is the shit that's hot now. See, I've been on a quest for the next wave. But never mind, that was just a segue. I must say, by your songs, I'm unimpressed, hey. But I love to see a black man. Things are heating up from the new wave of rap beginning to villainize Cole and labeling him as a boring rapper. Cole responded to all of this by having a conversation with Pump and giving him some advice on how to move in hip hop. Yo, so there's people that's watching this right now that's probably like... They probably won't believe it. Yeah, they say it's Photoshop. Yeah, facts. While J. Cole's warnings were ignored and Lil Pump's career fell off harder than a redneck at a family reunion like he predicted, Surprisingly, seven years later, in 2023, an interview with Complex Surface and highlighted this new reform version of the rapper. If you want the old pump back, I'll be in fucking jail right now, I'll tell you that. Like, <laughs> you guys don't want the old pump back. When I was young, I was just doing a lot of dumb ass ignorant shit. I'm just more grown, I just think about shit before I do it. Now I'm sober. I just can't believe that he's sober and still decided to dress up like Lord Farquaad, but that's neither here nor there. In January of 2019, Cole announced that Revenge of the Dreamers 3 was underway, which featured new additions to the Dreamville family including J.I.D. and Earth Gang. Recorded in only 10 days, Cole invited 343 artists and producers to Atlanta to work on a project. A couple of days after announcing the collaboration project, Cole would release his single, Middle Child, which will become his highest charting single. In Middle Child, J. Cole represents himself as the middle child of rap, situated between the old and new generations of hip hop. This positioning acknowledges the genre's rich history while embracing the evolving nature of contemporary rap. We've all seen, heard, and felt cries for racial justice across this country. ...that are on fire, uh, protesters here. Cities um, across the United States remain in a state of high tension tonight as the country braces President itself Trump for another wave of protests. President Trump addressing the American people just a short time ago as the toll of the coronavirus the widens here in the U.S. Officials in Minneapolis hoping for calm tonight after a former police officer was charged with murder and manslaughter in the death of George Floyd. 2020 was like everything else an interesting time for hip-hop ritual concerts and live streams became the norm genre bending was at an all-time high blurring lines and pushing boundaries legends like pop smoke and mf doom left this world and left their mark and the general message was clear everyone was anxious tired fed up and rightfully so Amongst the fed up population was the talented No Name when she called out rappers for not doing enough. Poor black folks all over the country are putting their bodies on the line to protest for our collective safety and y'all favorite top selling rappers not even willing to put a tweet up. Niggas whole discography be about black plight and they're nowhere to be found. Given the contents of their discographies, many fans assume No Name's tweets were aimed at Kendrick Lamar and J. Cole for being silent about the current events. Next day, Cole's picture protesting in the streets of his hometown, Fayetteville, North Carolina, as a subtle rebuttal to No Name Shaman. Responding to the criticism on June 16th, Cole unexpectedly released his first single of 2020, Snow on a Bluff, where he responded to her tweets commenting on how she should seek to educate as an aspect of her leadership rather than putting down the people who do not understand the implications of race relations in the country. Obviously with the current climate of black culture and the country as a whole, these tweets didn't go over too well. A month later, Cole released two more singles titled The Climb Back and Lion King on Ice in an EP titled Lewis Street before he would take a small detour to pursue one of his childhood dreams. It's no secret that Cole has a love for basketball. He often mentions his passion for the sport in his lyrics and interviews. J. Cole played basketball in high school and even played at the St. John's University basketball team, but he wanted to take it a little bit further. In August of 2020, Master P alluded to the fact that J. Cole might be taking basketball more seriously and potentially training for the NBA. Uh, when I talked to J. Cole, he was like, you know, big dog, you did it. And uh, what do you think I would have to do to make that happen? To get one of these NBA jerseys? It's not going to be easy, it's going to be a lot of hate, it's going to be a lot of people not believing in you. But you know, J. Cole, he got the right size in the gym, 
Later in the year, Cole posted this picture on Instagram with the capture stating, I still got some goals I gotta check off for a scram, hinting at a potential retirement from rap. Like the list said in his notebook, Cole's next project would be The Off Season, which released May 14th, 2021. The album was executively produced by T-Minus and felt like a refreshed version of Cole. Early music was a lot more of a vibe type of thing. When I think of Cold World, I think more so of maybe like something you will listen to at a kickback versus like as he started to mature as an artist, you could see that he started to go inward a little bit with what he was doing too. And like you could see as he matured as an artist, he became more comfortable with just putting out what actually spoke to him versus like what he might have thought would get him attention or fame or anything like that. For the release of the album, Cole would release a freestyle to promote his sixth studio album. In a video description wrote, the off season coming soon, all roads lead to the fall off, further leading to a possible retirement in the future. With talks about his next project, the fall off releasing soon, one can only imagine what the next era of his career will look like. But one thing we can be sure of is his story has inspired millions and will continue to do so just by being himself. As the middle child, Cole navigates the landscape of hip hop with a truly unique perspective, bridging the gaps between tradition and innovation while shouldering responsibility of influencing both past and future artists. J. Cole is without a doubt a reminder for many people, including myself, to strive for your dreams regardless of any outside influences. Regardless of how dark your path may look regardless of any obstacles in your way cole reminds us to keep pushing forward and trust the process even on your darkest days because there's no such thing as a life that's better than yours huh. Love